1 Corinthians 15 is described by William Barclay as both one of the greatest and one of the most difficult chapters in the New Testament. And it's all about the resurrection. Paul begins the chapter by demonstrating the reality of Christ's resurrection, documented by a number of eyewitnesses, including himself. Then he displayed the importance of a bodily resurrection. We looked at that in our last message, arguing how hopeless we would be if Christ had not been raised from the dead. Now in the last half of the chapter, Paul goes into detail about what the old spiritual calls that great getting up morning when Christ returns and we are resurrected. The dead in Christ shall be raised. Those who are alive and remain shall be changed. And Paul goes into great detail about that. Uh, Now there's not any one place you can go in the Bible that has all the information about resurrection. But this chapter uh, gives us as much as any one place in Scripture does uh, about the truth of the resurrection and what that means in our lives. Now Paul first addresses the character of the resurrection body uh, beginning in verse 35. Someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? These seem like honest, genuine questions. Questions that we might have. How is this going to happen? What kind of bodies are we going to have when, when we are resurrected? But notice how Paul responds in verse 36. He says, how foolish. Literally in the Greek here, he says, you fools. Why would he be so harsh? I mean, this seems like honest questions. And I think Paul discerns a difference. You see this difference actually in the months leading up to the birth of Christ. You remember in the Gospel of Luke, the first person we're introduced to is not Mary and it's not Joseph. It's actually a priest named Zechariah. And the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son. Well, that's great. Thing is, they're both old. They've never had children, never thought they could have children. And Zechariah says, how can that be? Again, depending on how you read the question, it seems like just an honest query. How can that be? But Gabriel detected unbelief. It wasn't just, how is this going to happen? It was, oh, come on, how can that be? And so Gabriel says, fine, you're not going to speak until the child's born. You didn't believe me? That's what happens. Now, you go later in the chapter, very same chapter, the same angel, Gabriel, appears to Mary and says to Mary, you are going to give birth to the Messiah. God's son is going to be born to you. And Mary says, how can this, how can this be? I'm a virgin. I'm not married. I've never been with a man. How can I have a child? And you'll notice Gabriel does not, does not condemn Mary for unbelief. Mary's question wasn't, oh, come on, how can that happen? Mary's question was, I don't get it. How, 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 can, how can that happen because of the situation I'm in? It wasn't that she didn't believe, she just didn't understand. And Gabriel explained to her. In fact, Gabriel praised Mary for her faith while rebuking Zechariah for his unbelief. I think Paul is detecting that in this passage. The Corinthians by saying, oh, how can the dead be raised? They weren't asking an honest question. They were being skeptical. (laughs) Oh, come on, how can that happen? And so Paul says, you fool. (laughs) He just throws it right back at him. Uh, He did not obviously read Dale Carnegie's book on how to win friends and influence people. He says, how foolish. What you sow does not come to life 
until it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon has another and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. Paul is making a point here. And the point is very important. Resurrection is not reconstruction. So what do you mean by that? Nowhere in the Bible does it teach that God, at the resurrection, will put together the pieces of our old bodies. That's not what resurrection is. He's not going to take our old flesh and bones and reconstitute them, and we end up like some kind of zombies, (laughs) okay? It's not that our corpses are going to be resuscitated. We are going to be resurrected. And in that resurrection, there is a transformation. Now, there is similarity or continuity, but there's also difference. We're going to be like we are now, but not identical to how we are now. There's continuity, but not identity. Now, the first analogy illustrates both the continuity as well as the discontinuity in the difference. All right, when you plant a seed, I, I think a corn, all right, you ever seen a, a corn seed? I mean, it's tiny, it's kind of dry. And not all that impressive, is it? But you plant a corn seed or a couple of corn seeds, what comes out? A big stalk with ears of corn that each ear has numerous kernels in it. Okay? It's not exactly what you plant. But what you plant does determine what comes up. If you plant corn, you're going to get a stalk of corn. You're not going to get a stalk of wheat. If you plant beans, you know, that's what you're going to get. And if you get something different, then somebody mislabeled the bag of seeds. uh, Because what the seed produces is what is part of that that seed initially. It doesn't look the same, but there's a connection. That's the continuity that we have. And so, what Paul is saying is, when we are resurrected, we will be ourselves. You will be you. I will be I. But you're going to be a better you, and I'm going to be a better me. So there is similarity and yet difference. We're going to be better than we are now. But we're going to know each other. We're going to recognize one another in that glorified state. And so there's going to be similarity, but there's going to be difference. And Paul uses these illustrations uh, of the seed being planted. He also uses the illustration of flesh. You know, he says, you'll notice that mankind has one kind of flesh, animals have another. You know, one of the things that always gets to me about this time of year and in the next month or two are the animals that are outside during the winter. You know, the bitter cold, and, and I think of the cows, I think of deer, I think of, you know, the various animals that are out there, and you feel so bad for them. But God has equipped them with a kind of skin, a kind of flesh, that can withstand the bitter cold much better than we can. Birds have a different kind of 
body structure than other animals do. Fish have scales. Uh, fish have gills, which can somehow breathe water. I, that just boggles the mind. But God has created each species unique. Then Paul uses the example of heavenly bodies. You know, you look up, there's the sun, there's the moon. Uh, they're different. Uh, the sun is a star, and it produces its own light. The moon is more like the earth in that it reflects light. It doesn't produce any of its own light. It still shines in the sky, but it's a different kind of light than the sun has. And when you look at the stars, some are brighter than others. Could be their size, it could be their distance from the earth, but they're similar, but they're not identical. And Paul is using these very common elements from nature to demonstrate that the resurrection body is going to have some continuity to our present bodies, but it's not just going to be the same old bag of bones resuscitated. It is going to be a new body, and I think it's fair to say new and improved. It's going to be much better than what we are experiencing now. So by these illustrations, uh, Paul is, is trying to explain how the resurrection body uh, is going to be similar yet distinct from what we experience now. He continues, beginning in verse 42. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. It's fundamental to Paul's thinking that the afterlife is going to be much more glorious than our life here on earth. And in order for that to be experienced, you need a body that is suitable for that kind of world. But it's still going to be a body that allows for our individuality and our self-expression. He doesn't view the body crudely. He describes it as spiritual. Uh, later, he differentiates it from the flesh and blood of verse 50. And here, his thinking is very different from the Judaism of his day. The Jews believed that the body that is raised is identical with our old bodies. It has all of the same weaknesses, all the same problems. And Paul says, nothing doing. No way. We're not going through this life again. That would be more like reincarnation. And nowhere in the Bible is reincarnation ever supported. That is not a biblical thought, and there is no way of supporting it in Scripture. We are going to have new bodies, and they are going to be different than our bodies now, uh, and they are going to be eternal. Now, you'll notice that in this paragraph, Paul distinguishes between the perishable and the imperishable. By perishable, that means our bodies eventually wear out and die. It's, they're not going to last forever. And given time, our bodies deteriorate. They wear down. Aging leaves its marks on all of us. The dimming of our eyes, the shutting the doors of our hearing, our lips tremble, 
Uh, we tend to be more fearful the older we get. You see this very graphically illustrated in Ecclesiastes 12. You see, all humans have a shelf life that is less than what we wish we had. Well, yet, when we are raised in our new bodies, that will all change. Instead of winding down, we're going to be winding up. We are not going to become tired and fatigued. We are not going to be ill or injured. We're not going to age. We are going to live forever and have a, an ageless relationship with God and with others. So that's the difference between the perishable, the dying body, and the imperishable resurrection body that will never die, never age, never deteriorate in any sense of the word. Then he contrasts the natural to the spiritual. Now the Greek term that's translated natural is psychikos. And it means to deal in the material or the physical world. And oftentimes it uh, has the implication of being led by our natural impulses as opposed to the Holy Spirit. In this natural life, we're always battling our sin nature. That's something we have from the moment we're conceived. David said in the Psalms that I was a sinner from when my mother conceived me. That's something we're born with. It's not the environment. It's, it's nothing except we are born with it. And in that natural body, we are always fighting against our sin nature. But when we are raised, there will be no sin nature. We will not have that, that inclination to sin. Now, someone once compared uh, human depravity to gravity, and I think there's a really good comparison there because it's that downward pull it's always there we're always drawn towards sin because of our sin nature but when we get our new bodies we're not going to have to deal with that yeah hallelujah is right it, it is going to be uh, a a perfect body it will be like adam and eve before they sinned how god had originally designed us all along in fact, in verse 45, Paul goes back to the creation. He refers here to Genesis 2-7, the creation of Adam, emphasizing the last line, and man became a living being. Uh, the word there in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament is psyche, and it means soul. Man became a living soul. We get the word psychology from that term. It shares the same root as that word for natural which Paul used in verse 44 to describe our present earthly bodies. But you'll notice that Jesus is a life-giving spirit. Now we have a new element brought in. And if you go back to the creation of man, remember God formed man from the dust of the ground. And that's what our bodies are mostly made of, dirt and water. But it was not until he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life that man became a living soul. Now what's interesting in the original language, breathe or breath and spirit is the same word. You could just as easily translate he spirited into his nostrils the spirit of life. And Jesus is that life-giving spirit that transcends the natural, greater than our natural selves, with our sin nature, with our cursed, decaying, aging bodies. Jesus is a life-giving spirit. Now you'll notice in this, Adam was passive. He became alive when God breathed into him. But Jesus is active. He gives life to those who put their trust in Him. And so Paul concludes in verse 49, And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. What happened to Jesus after His death and resurrection will happen to all those who trust in Christ when we are all raised together at the last day. We will be just like Him. 
And that's the character of the resurrection body. If you want to know what it's going to be like when we are raised from the dead, look at Jesus in between Easter and his ascension. That's the kind of body we're going to have. And it's going to be perfect. Paul then moves to the chronology of the resurrection body in verses 50 through 53. He says, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Now this needs to be read in conjunction with another passage. So keep your finger here or put a, put a little a bookmark here and turn back a few books to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In this passage, Paul is talking about the same event. And so we see... Uh, this, the similarities here kind of fills out the picture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Paul writes, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Same event. Little different emphasis. In Thessalonians, Paul is concerned about those who have died that had believed in Christ. The Thessalonians were afraid that they were going to miss out. When Jesus comes back, are they going to be a part of our lives and glory? And Paul says, absolutely, they're going to be raised first. Back in 1 Corinthians, the emphasis is a little, a little more on those who are alive and remain. He does say that the dead will be raised, and then he says, we will be changed. Notice the way he says that. We will not all sleep, meaning die physically, but we will all be changed. I, I always chuckle a little bit when I read this verse, because I remember seeing it uh, posted in a church nursery. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Gives a little different perspective there. <clears throat> but here Paul is talking about when Christ comes back. Now, did you notice the similarities? There is the shout. There is the, uh, the trumpet. The dead will be raised. The living will be changed. You also see this in a couple of other places in Scripture that talk about the return of Christ. The trumpet will sound. The voice of the archangel. Jesus comes back in the clouds. And so we know that these various passages, Matthew 24, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, they're all talking about the same event. All of these things are coming together when Jesus comes back to earth and we see that the dead, in fact, are raised. Now you'll notice in verse 50, back in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I declare to you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And I think here he's talking about two different groups. Flesh and blood are those who have died, the perishable are those who are in the process of dying but haven't died yet. And he's saying neither one of them can go into eternity that way. 
The dead must be raised and the living must be changed, transformed. And both will happen at the same time. So Paul assures his readers that the kind of bodies we have here on earth, perishable, susceptible to pain, suffering, and death, that's not what we're going to experience heaven in. And we see the resurrection of the dead saints, we see the rapture of the living saints, and all of the saints will be given glorified bodies like Jesus had after his resurrection. Now, if anybody asked Paul how this can be, he says, I've received it as a mystery. A mystery in the scriptures is not referring to a whodunit, you know, trying to unravel a criminal plot or something like that that we often use the word today. Mystery in the Bible is something that could not be known unless God revealed it. And there are a few different places where Paul uses this idea of mystery. Here, he's saying, God revealed it to me that this is how it's going to happen. When Christ returns, the dead will be resurrected, the living will be transformed, we will all be given glorified bodies, and we will all meet to the Lord in the air. So not everybody will go through resurrection. I don't believe that the believers that are alive when Christ returns will die and then be resurrected. He says this is going to happen in a flash, the twinkling of an eye. It's going to be that fast. Uh, the word flash in the Greek is uh, atomos, which is that which cannot be divided. They didn't know you could divide an atom. <laughs> and so it's, it's the smallest particle in a flash. In the time it takes to blink your eye, this is going to take place. When this happens, a trumpet will sound. Now in the Bible, trumpets were used for a variety of purposes. Uh, and in the Old Testament, oftentimes the coming of the day of the Lord was heralded by a trumpet or a series of trumpets, a time of wrath and judgment on the earth. Now I want you to notice something. Look at verse 52. Paul does refer to the trumpet. That again, we see in Matthew 24, you see it in 1 Thessalonians 4. But he describes it here in Corinthians as the last trumpet. Or in some Bibles, the last trump. What do we mean by the last trump? Many scholars believe this is just using Old, Old Testament imagery to describe the last day. But I think there's more to it than that. I believe that Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this specifically as he did, and that the last trumpet means the last at the end of a series. And there's only one place in the Bible that we see a series of trumpets. That's the book of Revelation. How many trumpets are sounded in the book of Revelation? That's an easy answer because anything in Revelation has the same number. <laughs> it's always seven, right? Seven trumpets. So the last trumpet would be the seventh trumpet. And that trumpet is sounded in Revelation eleven fifteen. Now, what transpires when that trumpet is sounded goes over the next few chapters until you see the first of the bowls of God's wrath being poured out because the seventh trumpet introduces the bowls of God's wrath. It's the last warning before the wrath comes. And so there's quite a bit that goes on in regard to that seventh trumpet. This view, which I came upon uh, later, after I had come to this conclusion that there's a connection uh, between the seventh trumpet of Revelation and the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians, uh, there is a book written by Marvin Rosenthal called The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church. And he goes into great detail. And a lot of what he has concluded is similar to where I have come to a conclusion, although we, we still have a few differences. 
But he also makes this connection. He says those four words at the last trump reveal in the clearest possible way the precise occasion when the rapture of the church will occur. And I believe that we find that in Revelation 14. You have your Bibles. Turn to Revelation 14. Again, this is all within the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Revelation 14, beginning in verse 14. And this is the last thing John writes before he gets into the seven bowls of God's wrath. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Notice, coming in the clouds, one like a son of man. Who's that? Jesus. That was his favorite way to describe himself. He has a crown of gold on his head. I think this is significant because nowhere is an angel ever described like that. And there are some commentators that say this is an angel. No, it isn't. No angel has a crown of gold on his head and is like the Son of Man. Angels are completely different than humans. Then another angel called out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was seated on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because of the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Again, I believe this is referring to Christ coming in the clouds and gathering all the believers. Those who had died will be resurrected. Those who were alive at that time, and from reading the book of Revelation, I don't think there's going to be many, but they will be changed, transformed into their resurrection bodies, and we will all meet the Lord in the air before the wrath of God is poured out on the earth. I do not believe that Christians will experience the wrath of God. We will be taken out before that time. We will experience the wrath of Satan. That's what's described in the chapters coming up to this. But not God's wrath. We will be taken now, we could spend a whole lot more time on that, and we will in a later message in a different series, but just tying all of these different passages together, I believe this is when this will take place. But what we definitely know from this passage is that Christ comes, there is the shout of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those who are alive and remain will be transformed, given their glorified bodies, and we will all meet the Lord in the air. We can debate and discuss when that happens in regard to the book of Revelation and the tribulation, and that will be for another time. That's my view. You don't have to agree to it. That's okay. We can disagree. But to me, that's where it fits in best in uh, all of Scripture. Let's move on, though, back to 1 Corinthians 15, because I don't want to miss um, Paul's conclusion on the resurrection body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the conclusion on the resurrection body, and it's put in the sense of a promise, beginning in verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's characteristic of Paul to see in all of this, a fulfillment of Scripture. And the first Scripture he mentions is Isaiah 25, 8. Death is swallowed up in victory. On that day, 
God will deal a fatal blow to sin and to death when our perishable mortal bodies are changed into the glorious eternal bodies that we will have uh, from that point forward. After the resurrection and rapture of believers, never again will we grieve the loss of a loved one. Never again will we worry about terminal diseases. Never again will we have to cope with the frailties of old age. Never again will we have to plan funerals, execute wills, or worry about loved ones we leave behind. Never again will we need to nurse the lingering emptiness and grief we feel when a loved one is taken from us. On that day, death's sting will be permanently gone. What a wonderful promise this is. In verse 56, Paul says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. You know, it's really not death itself that is harmful. You know, elsewhere in Scripture, Paul almost welcomes death. To live is Christ, to die is gain. But... Death is a problem where sin has not been taken care of. Where sin is pardoned, death has no sting. But where sin remains, death is the end. Death is therefore an evil which exists only because of man's rebellion against God. Now the word here for sting is used the way we often use it. The sting of a bee or the sting of a scorpion. Without sin, death has no way of stinging the human race. Sin is the instrument of death, and death is the needle. Sin is the poison. The law gives the environment in which the poison spreads. The law itself is good, but it shows how bad we are. It it reveals our sin. So it's only when sin is not dealt with that death is an enemy. That it is destructive. Our life is a life of victory. And that's the promise that we have. Verse 57, he gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then you have verse 58, which is often skipped over in this chapter. And that's too bad because it's really Paul's conclusion. It's it's the main point. Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's a hymn of praise to the Lord. It's an encouragement to us. Keep going. You may not see the results here in this life, but it's worth it. Because one day we are going to be given a body that will never die that will never age. That's eternal life. That's what we look forward to. That's the promise of the resurrection. We can be steadfast, unmovable in suffering. We can serve others because we know that it's not in vain. We know that with our resurrection bodies, God's going to reward us for what we have done here on earth. Nothing is skipped over. God sees it all. It's worth it. And you know, there are times when we wonder, is it really worth it? Is life really worth it? And Paul's answer is, yes, it is worth it because we're going to live again. It's not wasted. God is going to bring us back to life. We have an eternity to look forward to. You know, the Corinthians, they were prone to fickleness. They would shift from one position to another, sometimes without much of a reason. Paul says, you get a firm grip on this doctrine of the resurrection, and you won't be so easily shaken. And people today are sometimes moved by fear and worry and doubt. And we wonder... Is this life even worth it? Is it worth living? Why, do I, why should I bother serving the Lord? It all seems so pointless. And Paul says, oh no, nothing is pointless. Because we are going to live forever in God's kingdom. 
And what we do here will be rewarded there. What we do now is going to have an effect on our lives then. So stay with it. Don't be moved. The hope of glory is the strongest incentive we have for abounding in the work of the Lord. Because it is worth it. These profound promises are enough fuel to last a lifetime. The abiding hunger for a world set right will one day be satisfied with the resurrection in the world to come. But Paul concludes this discussion not on our future hope with another look forward, but with a hard look inward and outward. In light of the hope of the resurrection, made sure by Christ's own resurrection, We are to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in God's work. In other words, the doctrine of the resurrection ought to affect how we live. What we believe about the resurrection should affect how we behave. It's very practical in that sense. If we really believe in the resurrection of our body, then we're going to use our bodies now to glorify God. We look forward to that great getting up morning. We don't know exactly when it will happen, but we must always be ready. Even if we interpret scriptures in such a way that maybe the return of Christ, as described here in 1 Corinthians 15, may not be imminent, we never know when our own lives will come to a conclusion. I remember a Bible college professor of mine in describing And he believed that the coming of Christ would be at the end of the tribulation. And he was asked, but what about the imminence of Christ's return? I mean, are we to be ready at any moment for his return? And his answer was classic. He said, Christ may not come for all of us today, but he may come for you. We never know when he's going to come and say, your time on earth has come to an end come into eternity. And in that sense, we always need to be ready. And the way to be ready is to be doing what he wants us to do. So that whether we live another 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years, or if he calls us home tonight, we're ready to go. By believing in his word and allowing that to affect how we behave. Let's live each day as though it could be our last. Let's be ready whenever that day comes. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great promises of your word. And frankly, I can't think of a greater promise than the promise of resurrection. We have so much more to look forward to than just this life. And our experiences in eternity are going to be so much greater than anything we can experience now. Because our bodies are going to be infinitely greater. We thank you for raising our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead. And with him, giving us the promise that we will be raised as well. I pray that that knowledge will inspire us, encourage us, energize us, and motivate us to live for you now, knowing that we will live with you for all eternity.